Good afternoon. Uh, you, you have to excuse me for a second because I just realized I forgot to turn off the heating, so uh, I need to get that fixed. Um, yeah, okay, that's done. So, do you recognize this? Um, a lot of current technological promises involve connecting previously isolated devices to the Internet. And that is called the Internet of Things, the IoT, or in our household context, the smart home. So we can operate our lights and heating through our phone, our electricity consumption data gets sent automatically to the provider, and our fridge may even order our food. Now, this all seems very useful, right? But with this transformation towards increased connectivity, there may also be opportunities for unauthorized access. So the question is, with our washing machines and thermostats connected to the internet, should we be worried about cybersecurity? Now, cybersecurity usually seems to imply hackers. There are bad guys out there with sophisticated knowledge of information technology and networks who may use all this connectivity for obviously evil purposes. And because there will be programming flaws and other forms of lousy protection in the interface of our devices, we create opportunities for them. This is our smart electricity meter. It is said that with such a device, burglars could hack into our electricity consumption data, figure out when we're not home, and then do their job. Or if they manage to infect these devices with malware, they could even be used in a large-scale attack on a different target on the internet. So we have to think about how to keep those bad guys out when connecting our devices. But is that the only thing that security is about? And is connectivity the only transformation? I will argue that this view on cybersecurity in the Internet of Things is too limited. And I will use two examples to make that point. The first example is a smart alarm system, which can again be operated via my phone. And of course, this is very convenient because if I forget to set the alarm when I leave, I can do that remotely. But how does that work? When I use the app, I'm not connecting to my alarm system directly. Instead, I'm connecting to some server at the provider, which will forward the request to my alarm system. And that means that this server learns when I set the alarm, and it can then turn on or off the alarm on my request. Now, assume that you run a very smart criminal network and you decide to start selling alarm systems. And that way, you learn when people are away, because that's when they set the alarm, and you can also turn their alarm off. And that seems tricky. It's not a hack, but it's definitely a security issue. The underlying phenomenon here is that the, the connected things phone home. They are constantly communicating with the provider, and that means that the provider learns everything about how we use these devices. That doesn't only hold for things like alarm systems. What has raised surprisingly little discussion in this country is the transformation from analog to digital TV. With analog TV, your device would simply tune in to a signal that is transmitted anyway. With digital TV, your TV phones home and requests a specific channel from the provider, giving the provider access to what you watch. This also brings us to the second example, which is a smart radio that, besides receiving analog radio, also has the capability to connect to digital radio streams on the internet. We bought this a few years ago, and being able to receive loads of internet radio channels was a really useful feature. Unfortunately, that particular functionality disappeared after some time. It is speculated that the producer of these devices ended up in a conflict with the provider of the directory of internet radio streams. So, while the device is in principle still capable of playing digital radio, the unavailability of the digital tuner service makes this effectively impossible. 
What this example shows is that the providers don't only learn how we use our devices, they are also able to change or suspend functionality. And that's in particular true because a lot of these devices are updated automatically. And with automatic updates, functionality of these devices may change without any action on our part. So things will no longer work just because they aren't broken. And imagine in the future, your car may not even want to start if you haven't paid your insurance. What underlies these changes in power and control is a transformation from products into services. And I will illustrate this using a very simple example, which is binoculars. Now, what makes that a product? One of the key characteristics of products is that the purchase is separate from the use. So after I've bought my binoculars, the store has no business whatsoever in how I use the device. It's also quite predictable what binoculars do, uh, and they will keep doing that until something breaks. And what they do is they, uh, uh, they enable me to see certain things and they allow me to do certain things. But now assume that this would be a service instead. So there would be a service provider in the loop, and the service provider would be able to see what I see, and even be able to change what I see. Now that seems pretty scary, but that, that's exactly what's going on with the Internet of Things. So our things are being turned into services. They are being unthinged, and the purchase and the use are no longer separated. The provider sees how I use the devices. And that also means that, like we say in the, in the science of network security, we have to assume that all our communication with the device goes via Eve for eavesdropper, Mallory for malice, or Trudy for intruder. Now, when IoT providers sell these devices, they claim all kinds of access by unthinging our things. And claiming access is ultimately not very different from what hackers do. So what makes that we, are, we don't want to allow hackers access to our devices, but we don't seem to have any problem whatsoever in giving the same kind of access to others? This boils down to how we distinguish between trustworthy and untrustworthy parties. That's a threat model. We need to think about who can cause us harm and how much control we are willing to give away. But then the question is why this isn't higher on our agenda. And that's because this is a very political business. Security, in the end, is about regulating access to assets. And that also means that by framing security in a certain way, for example, by pointing to hackers as threats, parties may divert attention away from their own access. So as long as customers are worried about hackers, they don't think about access by the providers. So security politics decides who is a threat and who isn't. Now, it is often argued that the solution to this apparent power asymmetry is asking customers for consent. So if we would ask people whether they are okay with a certain access policy, they can, de they can decline if they don't like the scheme. But how many of you are seriously considering cookie warnings on websites? It doesn't work because um, uh, because it puts too much burden on the user. So we need, instead of putting the responsibility with the individuals, we need to make some collective decisions here about what kind of access and what level of access we allow. So in the politics of access, also called security, hackers are only one of the players. In the Internet of Things, a lot of power play is going on in terms of who gets access to what. By connecting our fridges, our washing machines to the Internet, 
they lose some of their thingness. They become services and they become part of this power play. And unless we make some collective decisions here, the transformation is not towards an internet of things, but towards an internet of non-things. Thank you.